So okay, all right. Hello out there once again to all of our listeners out there in points unknown throughout the Cotton Belt from the Florida Panhandle to California and all points in between. We want to welcome you and thank you for tuning in to the Cotton Companion Podcast. Uh, we are, I believe, on a, around episode 29. I should have had that written down rather than... I think we're 28. <laughs> 28. You're don't, jumping ahead of me. Don't let me lie to y'all. Do not want to be fake news. This is episode 28 of the vaunted Cotton Companion Podcast. Today is July 7. Uh, I am still recovering from the 4th of July holiday festivities. I know that most of y'all who are listening to our podcast likely live out in rural areas and maybe don't have to deal with annoying neighbors uh, this time of year. For me, uh, nestled in the very normally pleasant neighborhood of East Memphis, Tennessee, uh, it has been a, a weekend or rather a week filled with uh, loud explosions at two in the morning that, you know, uh, wake up the wife, wake up uh, the dog. We don't have one, but neighbors tell us the kids, the babies are waking up. I tell y'all, this is in an otherwise very uh, Mayberry-esque, friendly, Memphis is a city, but it has a very small town feel to it. Uh, the week of Independence Day can be a tumultuous t- <laughs> tumultuous time. And I, and I know that uh, my partner in crime, Jim Stebman here, understands that because he told me that he came home with essentially just an arsenal of, uh, I believe you called them mortar style <laughs> um, uh, fireworks, and he refrained from using the big ones uh, out of deference to his neighbors. So anyhow, that's a, that's a nice way of introducing uh, Mr. Jim Stebbin, who is the senior editor of Cotton Grower Magazine. Jim, I assume you are well rested since your neighborhood is down there in the suburbs of uh, Mississippi. A beautiful olive branch, Mississippi. Yeah. Uh, I, I don't know that I'm well rested or not, basically because we spent the 4th of July on uh, on my wife's family farm up in northwest Illinois, which for us is about a, you know, depending on how on traffic and everything else, is about an 8 to 10 hour drive each way. So, you know, we were just happy to get back home. I see. You're road weary. I'm, I'm road weary. You're not. Uh, you know the the fireworks thing doesn't uh, doesn't bother me, and yes, they were all legally purchased. Uh, <laughs> I, would, I was not implying otherwise. <laughs> I wouldn't have implied otherwise. And and I'm sure and I'm sure among our listeners, I'm certainly not the only person out there who's been involved in you know in fireworks expositions over the over the past week. So uh, I'm just glad uh, the everything is is over that uh, everybody still has their fingers. And uh, and we got through another year safely. So, and I hope uh, hope our listeners were able to do so too. Yeah, no doubt, no doubt. In celebration of this great country, we should we should mention obviously we are uh, very proud of the USA here at Cotton Grower Magazine, and thankful that we uh, were fortunate enough to be uh, citizens of it. So, as we speak, in addition to being uh, the week of July Fourth of Independence Day. We know that it's also the heart of a growing season out there. You guys, a lot of you guys are putting water on. It's a weed control season, hot and heavy at various points in the belt at the moment. I was actually speaking to a friend, a good friend of the magazine from the Corpus area earlier this week and uh, was asking him about the kind of in passing, said, oh, what type of water situation y'all got going on down there? And he was like, well, actually, you know, it's we're, it's defoli- we're, we're in defoliant season. I'm not trying to put any water on. And anyhow, it always catches me off guard on how big and buried the cotton belt is when it comes to production season. I ought not to be surprised by that uh, here coming up on a decade of being an editor at Cotton Grower Magazine. But I always am. To me, when I'm my, – my default mode is, well, everybody's on the same production schedule – as where I'm from in the Mississippi Delta. Uh, so if I'm not thinking about it, I do something dumb like ask a corpus grower <laughs> in, the, in the, the end of the first week of July what his water situation is doing, and, and he's talking about doing some harvest prep. So anyhow, uh, I don't want to step on Jim's toes. I don't want to, uh, to derail his conversation because I believe he is bringing us some crop progress numbers. So actually that little antidote about a corpus grower might be a good way of uh, uh, segueing into that eventually. He is going to bring us the July 5th crop progress numbers. Uh, other items of interest that Jim is going to tell us about in his news segment, uh, which we will bring to you next, 
include but are not limited to uh, the USDA planted acreage report plus the impact that the, that report has on the market. I don't know if you guys are frequenters of uh, cottongrower.com, but I know that our man, our economist down there in Georgia, Mr. Don Shirley, did a nice story on this, so I imagine Jim may be drawing from that uh, in this discussion of the planted acreage report and how that's impacting these prices. Uh, we will also talk about two brands that national brands that you all are no doubt familiar with, Wrangler and Hugo Boss, joining the cotton, the cotton sustainability efforts. I believe we'll be talking about cotton leads there. Was the Actually, headline. we'll be talking about several sustainability okay. programs. So. Okay, excuse me. Pardon me. Let, don't let me tell you all wrong. Um, <laughs> so that's uh, always good news when you have the national brands coming on board to help us market our product, cotton. So also... Uh, we're going to talk about the new executive director of ICAC, Mr. Kai Hughes, who is going there from uh, the ICA. And then finally, we want to talk about a topic that has been dominating the headlines here recently, a topic that we discussed in our last podcast, and that is uh, to bring you a dicamba update, some of the latest news out of uh, Arkansas, a hotbed for this debate and discussion. And uh, we're also going to talk some university recommendations on follow-up treatments at this point in the season. So we want to get to all that right after this break. For now, we're going to step away for just one moment, hang around, and we will be right back. Well, welcome back to the Cotton Companion. As, as Beck said, we're going to get, get into uh, a few news-related items here just to kind of keep everybody on tabs with what's going on in the industry at this point. And we will start with the uh, July 5th USDA Crop Progress Report. Uh, that report shows as of this week, uh, we're the, first of all, acres planted is, uh, you know, is, is done. We don't, we're not worried about uh, how much... Uh, how many acres are, are are still out there to be planted? The USDA is basically saying we're we're done with that. So the only reports we have now are for squaring and for bowl set and for uh, condition. Uh, we look at squaring. Uh, Forty-five percent of the crop is reporting uh, squares in the field at this point. That's up eleven percent over the past week. Uh, and nine states right now are running uh, ahead of their five-year average. On that, so again, we're off to a, again shows we're off to a really good start with cotton. It's uh, it's thriving in the the conditions, uh, considering some of the areas where it's been a little bit wet, maybe not as warm as growers would like. Uh, now we're moving into mid to late summer. I think we're going to start seeing a little bit more a uh, little more activity in some of the weather that that cotton really really likes. Uh, as far as cotton setting bowls at this point, we're sitting at 13 percent. Uh, that's up 6% in the past week. And as you can imagine, some of the areas where cotton was planted earlier, including those parts of South Texas, uh, you get some of the higher bowl set numbers at this point. Louisiana right now is reporting 31% of their cotton is showing bowls, uh, 30% in Arizona, 27% in cotton in Arkansas at this point, and Texas uh, looking at 15%. Of their crop, and I would say that setting bowls, the the, I'm sure that entire acreage is setting in the Corpus area south down into the Rio Grande Valley, at this point. Uh, as far as crop condition is concerned, uh, we're looking uh, looking at 54 percent of the crop is is still rated in the good to excellent range. That's just a little little bit of a drop from the past week or so. Uh, fair conditions, uh, we're looking at 34 uh, percent. We're still seeing a little jump or a little slow growth in the poor to very poor category. Uh, that's now sitting at 12% for this week. Uh, we may see that number climb a little bit more next week uh, as the impact from some uh, from pretty strong rains and hailstorms in uh, in the West Texas area uh, start factoring into this. Hated to see that. We, and saw, we all hate to see that. headlines coming off the high plains. Absolutely. But... Uh, I guess if you're looking for a glimmer of good news in all this, we have three states that have absolutely no cotton rated in the poor to very poor category, and that would be California, South Carolina, and Virginia at this point. So we're keeping our fingers crossed that that will hold up for those folks uh, as we again move into, uh, into prime growth season in all of those states. 
Uh, we're going to take a look at the uh, at USDA's planted cotton acres report. That was issued uh, on June 30th, uh, and this is really the first survey-based report that uh, that gives you a feel for how many acres were actually planted. Uh, this year, uh, the report is uh, is 12.1 million acres uh, that were planted. That's 20% increase above last year. Uh, Upland cotton acres uh, estimated at 11.8 million acres. That's up 19% from last year. Uh, the Pima area estimated at 252,000 acres, and that's up 30% from last year. Uh, we see we saw acreage increases for all cotton growing states, with the exception of Florida. Uh, Florida, uh, according to their numbers, 13% decrease in acres uh, for 2017. Uh, when you look at it from a regional perspective, from the southeastern states, it's all up 18%, basically from 2.2 million to uh, 2.6 million acres. Uh, in the Mid-South, acres are up 21%, from uh, 1.5 million last year to 1.8 million this year. In the southwest states, uh, Kansas, Oklahoma, and Texas, up 19%, from 6 million to 7.1 million. And the western states up 32% from 408,000 acres to 537,000 acres. Uh, the thing that uh, that, that kind of left people shaking their heads or scratching, you know, first of all, it's good news. More acres are always good news. Uh, it tells the market is the market is healthy uh, and that people are comfortable and and uh, and in putting cotton back into their mix in a much bigger way. The thing that's left people shake scratching their heads a little bit is 12.1 million acres is uh, is a little bit less than USDA's prospective plantings report that was issued the end of March on the acres they expected to be planted. Uh, at that point they were forecasting 12.2 million. So it's prompted a lot of uh, a lot of interest in, in, in watching the market this week. Once the report came out uh, on, th on the 30th, there was a little bump in uh, in cotton prices. In the market, because suddenly they're, the market's looking at it, going, "Oh, there's not going to be as much cotton out there as we originally thought." So the market bumped back up into the into the 72, 75 cent range. I wonder, was that reflective of those storms that we mentioned out in? No, this was before high the plains. storms. Oh, okay. This is this is before the high plain storms. Okay. Uh, that bump didn't last very long. Things just kind of settled back down again into the uh, you know into the high 60s, low 70s range. Uh, it's prompted a lot of economists and, and folks to look at it and go, well, where did all those cotton acres go? Uh, some, you know, some basically are, are looking at it from the perspective of, uh, you know, early, uh, early planted cotton may have gotten weathered out, may have had some problems, issues, had to be replanted into something else. Some acres may just never have gotten around to being planted due to, uh, to weather delays and other things. Uh, and, uh, uh, Beck mentioned uh, Dr. Don Shirley at, at the University of Georgia, uh, and in a column that uh, that he wrote and that you will find on CottonGrower.com uh, right now, it's sort of like it's it's causing a little confusion for growers who still might have some marketing decisions to make uh, for this year in terms of uh, what the market's going to do and, and where the prices are going to hold out. He says right now they're still holding steady in that uh, in that comfortable range, 68 to 72 cents. Um, but everybody's just kind of watching to see at this point. Uh, the weather issues in West Texas uh, obviously took out, uh, sadly, uh, took out several several thousand acres of, of cotton in hail due to hail. Uh, some of those were research plots on the high plains that uh, just will not be able to be replanted, so we're going to lose a year of data on some varieties and, and things out there. Uh, and the southeast is still pretty wet, pretty soggy in uh, in parts of South Georgia, uh, which is is preventing growers from getting into the fields to take care of some weed control, some lay by treatments, uh, insect management, things like that at this point. So uh, it's kind of a mixed bag across the uh, across the cotton belt. Uh, the mid south had some pretty decent rains over the Fourth of July holiday uh, that that may have slowed some things down as well. So. We'll keep an eye on that, uh, but again, USDA says we've got 12.1 million acres out there. We'll see what the harvested acres look like 
obviously when we get into uh, into October and November and that next report comes out. Put a, put a quick plug in to uh, weekly on cottongrower.com. We have uh, analysis from guys like Dr. Don Shirley down there in Georgia. We also run a weekly column uh, from our guy, Dr. O.A. Cleveland. Uh, I was about to say economist. Professor Emeritus of Cotton Economics. <laughs> I was, I don't know what kind of type of Greek uh, word I was trying to create there. Anyhow, uh, also contributes a weekly column uh, about analyzing this cotton market and factors like that USDA planted acre report and various weather events and how they impact which way cotton prices are going to go. So check in at cottongrower.com if that is the sort of thing that interests you. We know that it does with a lot of y'all. You, you want to hear what's going on with cotton prices. Right. You'll generally see that uh, those economic reports show up on our weekly e-newsletter as well. Uh, if it hits your, your email inbox every Tuesday morning, you'll generally find the links there to, uh, to that information as well. But moving ahead, uh, we've got uh, two well-known apparel brands that have uh, have signed up for a couple of the uh, of the cotton industry sustainability programs. Uh, we're going to start with with Cotton Leads, which is a a joint program, joint effort of the between the Australian and U.S. cotton industries. Uh, German uh, German based fashion house Hugo Boss has joined the Cotton Leads program. Uh, they are now part of the the. Basically, they're the latest of more than 460 partners from across the uh, global supply chain to, uh, to, to pledge their support uh, for the sustainability efforts and credentials of uh, the Australian and U.S. cotton markets. Uh, primarily looking at those two markets as the, you know, the majority of the high-quality cotton that, uh, that they're looking for. Uh, the, the Hugo Boss group includes both the Boss and Hugo brands. Uh, and one that's that's certainly probably a lot more familiar to most of us is uh, Wrangler has joined the Field to Market, uh, the Alliance for Sustainable Agriculture as an associate member uh, working to help increase supply of sustainable cotton. They are the first major apparel brand to join this initiative. And, and it, it this announcement sort of follows uh, the Wrangler's launch last month of a pilot project for sustainable U.S. cotton that they're currently wor- uh, that they currently have underway with a farming family in uh, in Athens, Alabama. Uh, this pilot program, Wrangler's basically going to to, to take forty thousand pounds of cotton from this farm. Uh, it's a well-known farm, uh, the Newby family down in Athens. At seven generations of farming experience, uh, and they're currently using a lot of uh, precision. Uh, techniques, uh, conservation tillage, uh, complex ro- crop rotation, things like that. Uh, Wrangler's plans are m- certainly to be very active in this. They're planning to work with Field to Market to expand this pilot program to create a program that includes multiple growers who are focused on uh, continuous improvement of healthy soils uh, that are focused on achieving best possible results for yield, uh, irrigation, uh, input use, soil conservation, and reduced emissions. So it's a uh, it's a it's a very it's a it's a major initiative that Wrangler is putting out there. Uh, the folks at the company are very serious about it, and uh, and we will uh, will follow that certainly from our perspective in terms of uh, of seeing how this pilot program works this year, uh, and uh, and where they move move forward from this point. But it's always uh, always nice to have. Uh, big apparel brands that uh, that are well known on uh, on store shelves to be jumping in, uh, working with the cotton industry on ways to uh, to continually improve. And uh, lastly, uh, before we get into uh, to some other discussions, real quick, uh, the name Kai Hughes may or may not mean a whole lot to many of you out, out there listening. Uh, Kai is. Uh, has been named executive director of the International Cotton Advisory Committee. Uh, it's an organization that's based headquartered in Washington, D.C. Uh, they are the international commodity body that represents cotton and cotton textiles. They do a lot of cotton-based research uh, around the world uh, and are really sort of the, uh, uh, 
I guess the the gathering point for uh, for for pulling all of this scientific information together. They work closely with Cotton Incorporated and other organizations similar around the world. Uh, it's a uh, it's it's a very prestigious organization. Uh, Kai will uh, ha- has been managing director of the International Cotton Association in Liverpool. Uh, for the past nine years, we've had the opportunity to work with him uh, from time to time in, at his at his uh, position at ICA. Uh, he's he's in, he's a very intelligent man, uh, very easy to work with, uh, knows a, a lot about about the world cotton industry, uh, has a really solid management background in a lot of different areas. Uh, he's going to be uh, taking on a. Uh, uh, an opportunity and a role here to uh, to I think really help and expand uh, with some of the cotton research programs. So again, he moves uh, he's moving from Liverpool to Washington D.C. Uh, hopefully that won't be too much of a culture shock for him, uh, and he'll start his new duties on September first. So uh, so our congratulations to Kai. Uh, I think uh, cotton research and 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 the uh, and the work for the global uh, global cotton industry are are going to be in good hands. And, uh, and then, finally, to kind of bring everybody, keep the updates going on, uh, on the dicamba situation, uh, primarily in the Mid-South, uh, the activity, the, most, the majority of the action is still hovering, uh, still circling Arkansas at this point. Uh, and the latest is, as of late last week, uh, the Arkansas governor has said he would back the Arkansas State Plant Board's proposal to ban dicamba uh, in the state uh, based primarily on the volume of complaints saying they justify emergency action. As of June 30th, that number was sitting at 507 complaints. Uh, on As of Wednesday of this week, that number had already grown to 551 complaints in the state. Uh, so basically, the governor has uh, has approved the uh, the recommendation of the state plant board. He has now passed that on to uh, the state's legislative council for review. Uh, as I understand it, they were scheduled to meet on Wednesday of this week. They have postponed that meeting until today. So uh, certainly, by the time we finish with this podcast, or by end of day, everything we're saying will be totally out of date. Well, the, uh, the... The last time we potted about it always this topic, works. it was the next day when the plant right. board made the ruling about uh, recommending to ban the product. Right. It uh, it always works that way. Yeah. You know when it, it it's a continuing news cycle. News does not wait for us to uh, you know to report it. But uh, so we'll we'll see how this works. There there are two things that are part of this proposed uh, ban. Uh, one is uh, basically. Uh, to pull dicamba, the dicamba products from the market with the exception of use for pasture and, and some other areas. Um, while, they, uh, while the state looks to investigate uh, and, and put together a long-term solution uh, for the state, uh, there's also an amendment in there that uh, basically would uh, implement a matrix that will increase penalties from, you know, basically from $1,000 to, but not more than $25,000 for, as they call it, egregious violations of dicamba rules that report, that uh, result in significant crop damage. So uh, everybody's waiting to see at this point what's going to happen uh, with Arkansas. Uh, I'd, we can report that uh, the number of complaints in neighboring states, uh, in Missouri, uh, in Tennessee, in Mississippi, uh, we're starting to see some uh, some activity in terms of uh, of drift issues there. Uh, no word at this point on what some of those other states will do, uh, other than just uh, monitor and document uh, at this point. But um, what you will find on um, out on CottonGrower.com, uh, there's some been some excellent material that's been put out there by uh, by our good friend Larry Steckel at University of Tennessee uh, over the past week in terms of what should you do at this point if you're if you still have weed issues in cotton 
uh, the pigweed is still still out there. What can you do to uh, to to take care of that without jeopardizing uh, the possibility of, uh, of of some more dicamba movement at this point? Uh, Larry's basic comment this week is cotton is at a stage right now where the best way to avoid dicamba drift is just to stop using it. You're sort of reached that point for where if you've used it for your first initial application and now it's time to come back with that second or sequential application, uh, his recommendation is to uh, is just to move straight to Liberty uh, for the follow-up sprays at this time uh, until they can sort of get through, see what the situation is with, uh, with potential dicamba damage uh, where it's coming from and things like that. In fact, he uh, we posted an article, I think yesterday, day before yesterday. Anyway, it's up on cottongrower.com, uh, where he he offers a lot of several options for both uh, post direct and hooded uh, tank mixes or mixtures for uh, for weed control whenever uh, growers are going out for their add that to their lay by application. So it's uh, it's good information. Uh, please check it out. Uh, in Texas, uh, there have not been a lot of reports of dicamba movement. Uh, and again, that goes back to what we, I think we stated in, in our last podcast, the vast majority of growers are doing what they were supposed to do, following label directions, following the training applications and things like that. Uh, West Texas right now is probably going to be the next, uh, next potential point in this. Uh, cotton is, is up and out of the ground. Uh, now that they've had these weekend rains and things like that, the dryland acres uh, certainly have enough moisture if they survived the, uh, they didn't manage to, uh, to get hit with hail. And so now kind of entering the weed, the, the post-application season for weed control in that area. Uh, the word we're getting from, uh, from some of the weed specialists up in the, in the High Plains area, uh, make sure that they are, they're targeting weeds that are less than four inches if you're using these new technologies. Uh, be aware of nearby crops and basically, you know, be a good neighbor. Uh, let your neighbors know what you're doing, what you're spraying, what you're applying. Uh, and, uh, and, and again, follow the, uh, the labels as, uh, as written. Yeah. Uh, again, it's, it's, it's a stewardship thing that, uh, that again, vast vast majority of our growers have have done a yeoman's job in uh in following those those uh those instructions and recommendations uh and you know it's it's just an unfortunate situation when when you're dealing with a product uh that that can be as volatile as dicamba uh and some of the environmental aspects and situations that we found uh parts of the cotton belt particularly in the mid-south have found themselves in over the last uh last month or so so We'll, uh, we'll continue to monitor the situation uh, and see what happens. I think we know where Arkansas is going. We'll see if, uh, if any of the other states follow suit at yeah, this it's, point. It's definitely the neighboring states that we're, that we're keeping an eye on at this point. And, it's, and, you know, maybe a little bit of inside baseball here or, or peek behind the curtain. But, but I, I am currently working on some, a story um, – that's not explicitly about this, but I'm, I, I am hearing from and wanting to talk to other growers from around this Mid-South area who are saying, and, and their story needs to be told as well, you know, hey, in my corner of this, uh, of this part of the Cotton Belt, in my county, we're stewarding it correctly, where everybody's following mm-hmm. label rates, and we don't have this, we, we don't have these complaints. Right. And so there are certainly those guys out there, and they, and the reason that people are volunteering this information to me because they see this as, you know, not that they're not sympathetic to people who are suffering from off target drift and it's damaging other crops, particularly soybean crops in the mid South, but they're saying this is an important tool for me and we're using it correctly and we're Mm -hmm. not having these problems. So, you know, they're, they're going, I hope our state doesn't take this tool away from me. Exactly. This is a valuable tool to Mm -hmm. me. Uh, I, you know, I'm a farmer here. My voice deserves to be heard too, and w- and we need this product. And yeah. you know, it, and it's it it should be noted that the, these are people in states uh, where all of the dicamba formulations are available to them in the mid south, and you know, 
They're just not having, um, I feel like if you were to just peruse headlines and not read stories, you wouldn't know that there are certainly pockets of the Mid-South, even in Arkansas, Mississippi, Tennessee, uh, Louisiana, the Boot Hill of Missouri, where people are using Dicamba and they're not having these issues. Exactly. And that's, that's, that's always the danger in this, and, and we certainly try to, you know, you, you, we don't want to paint the whole, all cotton growers with a big wide paintbrush uh, again. Uh, it's, it's a situation that we need to monitor. It's obviously a situation the states and, and quite honestly, EPA are monitoring as well. Uh, because remember, when these, when these labels were approved for, uh, for products like Ingenia and Extendamax, uh, they're on a two year trial, they're on a two year label at this point. Uh, which means obviously after this year and after next year, if there are still issues in the market that just don't look like they can be solved, or still continuing to be a problem, EPA has the option to pull those labels and pull the products. Um, nobody wants to see that happen. You know, we need every tool we can get in the weed control toolbox out there. So, uh, again, I think you'll uh, you'll hopefully we'll start uh, certainly from our perspective. You're going to start seeing the other side of the uh, of the story, uh, and I believe you will from from a lot of. Uh, a lot of other situations as we move through through the season and get into uh, into the later part of the growing season. Yeah, Good. Jim, you know, but I, as part of that, I for I was trying as part for part of this podcast to get a hold of our guy, uh, our buddy, Gala Morgan, who is a state cotton specialist over there in Texas, and uh, he's got to be out in the middle of a field at a field day or something because he pocket dialed me about four times in a row, and I could just hear that wind blowing. <laughs> And, it, and what I imagine was some corn leaves or, or something, you know, leaves rustling in the background. Anyhow, uh, Galen, we will be getting in touch with you soon to, to get the lowdown on, on this situation in Texas uh, as well as in other parts of the belt. So keep following Cotton Grower. We'll, we'll, we will be your Dicamba, Dicamba Central. Maybe we'll have like a landing page on the website or something with all the – bells and whistles and graphics around this topic because we know that you guys are interested in I'm joking about going that far but we know that y'all are interested in this topic we can see the metrics from our website anytime we're talking dicamba you guys are tuning in to uh to see what's being said so we will we will stay on top of it is that it that's that, it is that our uh, I, th- I think that's probably enough that's all of our news items good deal um if that is indeed the case We want to thank you, Jim, for once again piloting our news segment. You guys stick with us through this quick uh, music break, and we will get you out of here on the flip side of that. So stick tight. So, all right, that is going to just about do it for this installment of the Cotton Companion podcast. Uh, You guys may have noticed we are installing a new subscription drive uh, centered in part around our podcast platform. The idea uh, you may have picked up on is to encourage as many of you as we can to sign up for Cotton Grower Magazine and the Cotton Grower e-newsletter. If you are already receiving those two things, and it's been a while, particularly with the print magazine, since you uh, signed up for that, we would encourage you to go ahead and do that. You can go to the homepage of cottongrower.com, scroll to the bottom of the page, and you will see a little link that says subscribe. Click on that, and it's very intuitive. It'll walk you through. Uh, Honestly, it's as easy as plugging in your home address and, uh, you know, letting us know who you are, where you are. And that way, that refurbishes our uh, our lists, as we call them, our subscription lists, which are the lifeblood of our business. As you know, everything we produce is free to the market that we serve, to you. All we ask is that you, you just sign up for it, and that would help us tremendously. So that's my plug for the day. Uh, as I say, if you haven't subscribed to our e-newsletter or magazine in a while, just visit cottongrower.com. You will find the subscribe link at the bottom of the page. You can resubscribe there. That's just as valuable as subscribing the first time to us. We want to thank you sincerely for joining us today. If you like what you're hearing, by all means, tell your farmer friends about this very podcast, The Cotton Companion. You and they can get to this thing in one, any one of three easy ways. The first 
is to go to cottongrower.com, find the search bar at the top of the home page, and just type in Cotton Companion. And uh, you click the little magnifying glass right next to that search bar, and it will take you to a landing page where all of our previous 28 episodes are housed. Uh, and you can sort by headline. The topic of each one is in the headline there. It's pretty neat, especially for those of you who are bored, twiddling thumbs, using the GPS auto steer in those long rows this summer. Pass the time with us. Tune in to the uh, Cotton Companion podcast. You won't regret it. The second way you can reach them, uh, you can subscribe to our channel on iTunes. If you are familiar with iTunes, if you have a smartphone, an iPhone, just go ahead and subscribe to our channel via the iTunes app. And uh, once you do that, you could go another step, leave us a rating, let us know what you think of the Cotton Companion podcast. We would truly appreciate that. The third and final way, the best way to uh, reach the Cotton Companion podcast to make sure you are receiving each installment is to sign up for our weekly e-newsletter, the Cotton Grower e-newsletter. Jim here works hard to pack that thing with all of the relevant news of the day, and they hit your mailbox like clockwork each Tuesday morning. Occasionally during the production season, they will also hit your email inbox on Thursday mornings. Um, You can do that by going to cottongrower.com, scrolling to the bottom of the page, finding that link to subscribe. Click on that and find the e-newsletter subscription, and uh, it's easy peasy. Uh, Also, lastly, we want to make sure you are following us on social media. We are active on both Twitter and Facebook. You can find us on Twitter. We are at cottongrowermag. And on Facebook, you can find us by simply searching for Cotton Grower Magazine in the Facebook search bar. We hope that you are still enjoying our latest issue, which was the May-June issue, combined issue. Our next one won't be to you until we do another combined issue. August-September should be the 1st of September when that gets to you. So right now, we hope that you are rocking with us via the website and the podcast while you wait with bated breath for that August-September issue. And it's going to be a good one. It's going to be a cracker, let me tell you. A firecracker, I should say. Um, This podcast is produced by Mr. Mark Antonelli. He works at the Mothership, Meister Media Worldwide in lovely Willoughby, Ohio. My name is Beck Barnes, and I will be back with you in two weeks on the next episode, the 29th episode of the Cotton Companion Podcast. For now, on behalf of my own Cotton Companion, Mr. Jim Stebbin, we wish you and your cotton farm all the best. <laughs>